This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. Men without work. I welcome Nicholas Eberstadt of the American Enterprise Institute to help me understand his book published some years before and now republished with a post-pandemic note from the author about what we learn from these years of statistics about men without work. I will transfer my thinking immediately to a metaphor that Nick uses in the course of his presentation, a ghost army. Nick, congratulations again for updating your observations of the middle of this second decade of the 21st century. We're now plunged into the third decade. And after the pandemic, there are lessons here that are fresh. We're going to begin, however, with what is the ghost army? What do you mean by that? Thank you, Nick. John, thank you so much for inviting me on. The ghost army are the men without work in modern America. I'm focusing in particular on what are called the men of prime working age, not my term, 25 to 54 years old, the backbone of the economy still, the group that is absolutely indispensable in the forming of families and the raising of children as well. Um, for over half a century, we have seen a collapse of work for this critical group, mainly due to an exit of men from the workforce altogether. And as we speak, John, over 7 million men between the ages of 25 and 54 are out of the workforce altogether, neither working nor looking for work. Uh, in in the old uh, in the ancient classical days, uh, if one talked about a Roman legion being decimated, that meant that they had lost a tenth of their membership. We now have lost over a tenth of our prime age men from the workforce. They're out of it altogether. They're not even unemployed because they're not looking for work, but they are in this nether world, which I think we can talk of as a ghost army. Yes, the ghost army. Now it came from somewhere. And I learned from Nick that you can identify the decades that I've lived. Nick, this is perfectly for my life, born 1948. That's the beginning of the top of the pier. A uh, pinnacle for for labor force participation rates. So let's do some glossaries. LFPR. I just said it, but what does it mean? What? Why do you use that as a way of measuring men without work? It it is jargon which stands for labor force participation rate. It is the proportion of people in any group. We're looking at men right now, but the proportion of people in any group who are either employed or looking for work. And that is a way of measuring the cohorts as they come online. For example, you just said 10 million, you break it down further. This is a, a few years out of date, but not profoundly. 1.2 million between 20 and 25, 5.5 uh, million between 25 and 54, and then everything else is over 54. So we're looking at groups that are consistent period, uh, segment after segment in decline for participating in the economy. When, I know we're going to get to 965, when do you first see it in the numbers that men are declining in the workforce? Does it show up right after the second war in the 50s and 60s? Where, Nick? Excellent question. Uh, John, of course, our labor statistics were set up to fight the last war, to fight the Great Depression. Our current labor statistics were devised uh, to go into a force in 1941-42. We had a little kind of interruption. I can't remember what it was, so it was postponed until uh, the late 40s. Uh, but they were set up basically with the assumption, which is a Depression-era assumption, that if a guy is uh, out of work, he's going to be looking for a job. And they didn't pay much attention to the people who were labor force dropouts. And that was a pretty good assumption for the first two post-war decades, because American men 
were not only almost fully employed, they were virtually fully engaged in looking for work or being part of the workforce. It was only a tiny fraction, around 3%, little over 3% of prime age men who were neither working nor looking for work during those two decades. Now we come to 1965, and this is where the numbers become shocking. 1965, the labor force participation rate, that's what Nick identified for us, was 96.6, which is pretty good. I mean, that's everybody's work and who's prime age. 3.4% were were not in the labor force. But by 2015, 50 years later, we're at 88.2. And that's a profound change because we now have 11.8%. I'm following your reporting, Nick. Yep not in the labor force. There's the mystery, right? Those 50 years, what happened? Strikingly, you also say it's a generational decline. How so, Nick? Well, you can think of it kind of like rings on a tree, except they're rings that are shrinking in towards the center of the tree. Over a life course, guys tend to work, well, they start out not working at all, then they're working a lot. Then at later ages, they start to work less and less. They go into retirement. Um, Right after World War II, didn't matter whether you were in your 20s, 30s, 40s, early 50s, very, very, very high rates of involvement in the workforce. But then 10 years later, at every age group, for the group that was born 10 years later, at every uh, age, uh, people worked less. Uh, the group that's 10 years younger than that, their trajectory is still lower. 10 years after that, it seems to be on a track to be lower still. So uh, over the life course, each, uh, each younger brother is on a lower trajectory than the older brother. Each son is on a lower trajectory than the father, on average. There's another term of art, NEET, N-E-E-T. What does that refer to? Why is that important here? N-E-E-T, NEET, originally comes from uh, across the ocean from the UK. It means neither employed nor in education and training. Some people, about a tenth, a little bit more than a tenth, of the guys who are neither working nor looking for work are actually full-time students getting ready to go back into jobs at maybe higher pay and higher levels of qualification. That's not such a bad thing. Uh, What we're really concerned about are the people who are dropouts from the workforce who aren't training to get back into it. And that those are the needs. You provide us a contrast with other dynamic economies, post-war, post-second war economies. And you make a list of why these states are striking because they have uh, so much, uh, so fewer of these men without work. We have a more robust economy. I took your list because it's it's positive here. We have a more robust economy, a more flexible, dynamic economy. We work more hours. You and I work all the time, Nick. We don't not work. This is the way we were trained. We have a rise and yet and we have a limited welfare state compared to our European allies and even Japan. And yet we have a rising proportion of non-working men. It's That's a complete quandary. It really looks like a mystery, doesn't it, John? Because we know that in every post-war democracy, industrial affluent democracy, there's been some decline in work rates and labor force participation rates by men. Uh, It's been some, Um, but nowhere has it been as radical and harsh and severe and consistent as in the USA. Uh, It hasn't been this bad in Greece, which is kind of on uh, life support a lot of the time, the, the economy. If you take a look across the border, Uh, to the north. There are no two rich countries that are as close to being twins as Canada and the US. But our decline in workforce participation for men is 
strikingly more severe than in Canada. Who are they? When we come back, Men Without Work. This is the post-pandemic edition by Nicholas Eberstadt. He's a political economist. He holds the Henry Vent, the Henry Went Chair at the American Enterprise Institute. Ten million men without work, not looking for work, and surviving in some fashion in this rich and dynamic culture. Who are they? Nick, this is a mystery that can be solved by categories. I learned from you that a married man with children and foreign born is guaranteed to be at work, guaranteed. It's, it's automatic. And those categories, if not followed, oh, education, uh, with a high school or better education, guaranteed to be at work. And if those categories are not followed, that's who they are, correct? The odds are really striking here, aren't they? So if you are a foreign born guy in the USA, it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is or practically what your educational background is, you're more likely to be uh, in the labor force than your native born counterpart. And with respect to marriage, um, it's an amazing how much lower the work and labor force participation rates are for guys who've never been married than for guys who are married. By the way, also, John, interesting fact, uh, even for guys who are not married, if they have kids under the same roof, they're way more likely to be looking for a job or working. It's, it's something like the provider impulse, you know? It is. And we we have another term that's obvious now, the NILF, not in the labor force. As of 2015, when Nick had the most recent statistics for his publication, there were 7.2 7 million men not in the labor force. We've identified a couple of details about marriage. Yes, is important. But the foreign born thing, let's Let's linger on that one a moment, Nick, because you know immigration is much in the news everywhere. It's in the news in Europe, in the, the traveling of people from the Sahel or from the Middle East into the European Union. It's certainly here with the border crises. These foreign born men are much more likely to work, to be uh, breadwinners and to educate themselves, to go back to school. They're a very desirable demographic. Well, the situation may be somewhat different in some of the European countries, so I don't want to speak about those. But in the U.S., it is very clear that men who come to the United States are coming to work. Uh, they have uh, their work rates and their labor force participation rates are much higher than their native-born counterparts. That. Uh, that does nothing to excuse or defend illegal immigration to the United States. That's a question about American law. I'm just describing what people from abroad uh, do when they come here for work. Yes, the, the, in other words, the template is they come here to loaf. That is the opposite of the statistics that you're presenting. Also, we asked the question in your book, what do they do? They're not working. So they're not working. They're either at home or on the street. Do we have a breakdown of activity? We have a self-reported breakdown of activity, which is maybe in a sense even more meaningful. It comes from uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics time use surveys that people employed, unemployed, and not working or looking for work have all filled out. Now, we know everybody's a liar with surveys, but still there's some very important and I think rather uh, alarming information that comes from this. According to the NEET guys, the ones who are neither working nor looking for work or training or education, they basically they report, they basically do not do civil society. No, almost no worship, almost no volunteering or charitable activities. They've got a whole lot of time on their hands, but they do remarkably little, they say, help around the home or helping with other people at home. What they say that they do is to watch screens. The surveys don't tell us what they're watching. They don't tell us what kind of screens. But we're talking about something on the order of 2,000 hours a year. Now, for most people, that's like a full-time job. 
Um, to make this tableau even more dispiriting, John, some other additional time use surveys from the government reported before the pandemic uh, that these men who are neither working nor looking for work, almost half of them report taking pain medication every day. So it's not just playing uh, you know, World of Warcraft, it's playing World of Warcraft stoned. Uh, you do break down not uh, NILF, not in the labor force, versus men who are in the labor force, versus men who are unemployed and looking for work. It's stark. The number doesn't matter. Much, so, uh, the, what it's about, what it's referring to doesn't matter so much as the scale. 472 for not in the labor force, 221 for working. This is for socializing, relaxing, or leisure, screen time. So we're looking at more than a full-time job. That's like working a 16-hour day at socializing. So you're, you're in a ghost army. You're, you're regarded as, at least our economy treats you as dispensable. We also condemnatory. I note that all of our culture, uh, as you say, uh, leisure produces culture and culture produces leisure. Our, our culture condemns or, or derides or in some fashion chastises people for being idle. Does, and that doesn't change the, uh, the meaning of being without work, although it must do something to self-esteem, Nick. It surely does something to self-esteem because we can look at what's going on with the so-called deaths of despair in the United States, the deaths from drug overdoses, from suicide, from cirrhosis. Uh, this is Ann Case and Angus Deaton's uh, classification from some years back. I mean, these are uh, these are looking a little bit too much like Russia for comfort, if you see what I mean. So it's not... It's not as if people are dropping out of the workforce and then enhancing themselves through the use of free time or restoring themselves through the use of free time. What's suggested by the mortality numbers is that people are on a track towards misery. We need to talk about things that are not in this book right now and that Nick's colleagues have contributed. His book, Men Without Work, republished as a post-pandemic edition, and we will come to what Nick can tell us of the statistics after the shutdown of the American economy in the late winter, early spring of 2020. But now to two of Nick's colleagues, Henry Olson and Jared Bernstein, who contribute a, dis a different look at the Men Without Work statistics we've been discussing. I begin with, with Henry Olson because he speaks of recessions. There have been seven since the war, I believe, Nick, is the, what you provide. And he points to the twin shocks of the 1970s. Why so? What does that mean to, for him? Well, so Henry is talking, Henry is talking about the uh, about the recession and stagflation, the uh, the big shocks that came to the economy, uh, where we started to see the decline in manufacture, or the really acceleration of the decline in manufacturing, and Henry and other uh, other critics, and I think it's great to include some critics and dissent in a book because you get the argument started, uh, have pointed to these structural changes as being fundamentally unfavorable to the former male sort of employment mode. The observation is that you've overestimated government causes and underestimated the change in the labor market. That would be the twin shocks of the 1970s. And yet there's more here. This is what was known as the Rust Belt, right, Nick? The deindustrialization yes, right. of the Midwest. And I was, in reading your book, I had this image in my mind, I don't know, about factories getting out and seeing this team of human beings moving in this way, all men, and then they go through the front gate and go on to their lives that day. And then the next day they'd reverse the course. That was possible in the 1960s, but it was all gone by the 1970s. I'm, I'm imagining how Henry Olson is looking at this. How does that change men without work in his case? Well, Henry would argue, I think, that uh, big economic and structural changes in our system economy um, 
had a lot to do with the demand for labor in the United States, and that this was a major driver of the patterns that I am now describing. I think I think that would be doing. Uh, I think that would be fairly representing some of Henry's arguments. Yes, and so these shocks continue. Each time there's a plunge and then a recovery of a men in participating in the labor force. But it is not consistent with entitlements, he says. Economic changes push men out. What entitlements is he talking about? Is this unemployment checks or more, or more considerable? More considerable than just unemployment, because remember, people who have dropped out of the labor force are not eligible for unemployment. They're not unemployed. You have to be looking for a job to get an unemployment benefit. Uh, one of the uh, one of the key uh, ins social insurance benefits is disability program payments uh, for people who qualify as unable to work and. In the period right before the pandemic and the years before the pandemic, as I show in this uh, in this book, uh, over half of the guys who are neither working nor looking for work are obtaining at least one of these benefits. Uh, about two thirds of them live in a home that's getting one or more of these disability benefits. That's what we call the safety net. And Henry Olson points to the SSDI, which is Social Security Disability Insurance, insurance yeah. uh, rising, actually he uses the word soaring, during the Great Recession of 2008 to 2010. And that is evidence for him that these are men who are gaming the system. Is that how he sees it? Um, I think he sees this as... Uh as a, a kind of a lifeline for them, that this is something where they, that their jobs have gone away and the SSDI or some of the other systems too, are sort of an alternative income source to what previously had been work. That would be true if there weren't jobs available. I understand that. And we'll, we'll come to that. But right now I wanna to turn to Jared Bernstein. We've established that Henry Olson thinks that it's, uh, it's uh, it's shocks to the system caused by changes in the economy, the labor force itself, either deindustrialization or digitalization or the move into the 21st century of the global globalization. But Jared Bernstein, first of all, he identifies that we all know this, Nick. Well, I didn't know it. <laughs> so, so I'm pleased to know that you political economists knew about a ghost army. I didn't. I always thought it was the unemployed, but you're quite discerning. He also identifies this as a left-right issue. I didn't know that either, Nick. I didn't. I, unemployment, I was unaware, was partisanship. But okay, fine. He identifies it as such. Now we come to some terms of art that you need to help us with. If I understand your general argument about where this come where this came from in time and what contributed to it, you make a supply side argument, whereas Mr. Bernstein, a notable economist, makes a demand side. So let's start with the supply side. What, what does he mean by supply side case for where the ghost army comes from? Oh, uh, he is saying that my argument is mainly about holding back labor, men not supplying their labor into the workforce because um, maybe they're on disability or maybe they're doing something else, but they're, they're holding back their labor. Whereas his argument is that the more important point is that demand is weakening that demand, especially for less skilled work, has been weakening over time. Uh, so both, both Jared, who is now at the Council of Economic Advisors in the Biden administration, and Henry, who is uh, more conservative at, a, uh, at the Ethics and Public Policy Center uh, think tank in Washington, both of them, for different reasons, um, are convinced more by the idea that economic and structural change is behind this dramatic transformation I described. 
So your presentation is that supply side, these men are not prepared to work or have distanced themselves from work, or they, they have deliberately avoided skills such as graduating from high school, for example, to provide the opportunity to work because that's not a major focus for them. On the demand side, it would be that the factories or the coal mines went away and we've got to adjust or make a transition. That would be the big government part of this. There's also the matter of the baby boomer, that's me, aging out. How does that contribute? Well, uh, with, with the aging out of our baby boomers, that, that tends to make society grayer in general. It tends to be part of a graying of society and all other things being equal. If people over the age of 55, let's say, or over the age of 65, have lower work and labor force uh, connections than younger people, that tends to depress the overall uh, employment rates for the popula the adult population. Okay. Now there's some, I want to go back to your original case because there's some statistics here that seem to speak in opposition to some of these observations. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the LFPR of the native born versus foreign born. Mm -hmm. uh, that that isn't about uh, changes in labor force. That's about men coming here to work to find their work wherever they can. Correct. Correct. And John, even more to that point, more apropos, look at the work rates and labor force participation rates of American guys who do not have high school degrees. They're the most disadvantaged educationally of any group in the labor force, and yet foreign-born and married guys with no high school degree have work rates and labor force participation rates that are just about the same as native-born right. college grads. Also, regional. You would expect regional declines, not uh, specific to towns. And yet, Nick, you provide that West Virginia is next to Maryland. West Virginia has one of the largest, highest, and not in the labor force and Maryland has one of the lowest. Same for Maine and New Hampshire. Maine has one of the highest, not in the labor force. New Hampshire have, has one of the lowest. That appears to me to mitigate the, uh, the case for demand side. Well, if we have a national economy and a national labor market, it would seem uh, more than passing strange that you'd have extraordinarily high rates of inactivity in one state that is adjacent to another one with extraordinarily low levels. I mean, we have invented U-Hauls after all. And uh, that leads me to one detail that you and I uh, want, need to touch on, which is in your chapter, criminality. Uh, I do not believe, I think you make it very clear in your book that we don't have accurate or available or comprehensive statistics about men who have been incarcerated and are now out of jail or men who are coming out of jail and how they live the rest of their lives. Uh, we don't have those statistics adequately. Is that correct, Nick? We practically don't have them at all. Uh, if When I started this book, um, I thought that I would just go to the statistical abstract and look at the chapter on employment rates for ex-cons. And it turned out there was no chapter like that. As I looked further, even the Bureau of Justice Statistics doesn't keep a head count on how many ex-cons there are in the United States, much less income, much less health, much less working patterns. So we now have an invisible population at this date with uh, the revised new edition of the book where we probably have 25 million invisible ex-cons in the United States, overwhelmingly men, of course. And what we have then is no clear understanding of how much they participate, how much, how many of the ex-cons are in the NIF, how many of them are what we call the homeless, how many of them are vulnerable to drug overdose? You know, over 100,000 have died recently on drug overdoses. We don't have those stats. Is that correct? No, we don't have those stats. I mean, I think it's kind of shocking. I, I, it's all the more shocking because our system of government was set up as a evidence-based 
policy uh, system of government. Back in 1790, we had a national population count, which was pretty high tech when you think of it for back in the 18th century. But for some reason, we have forgotten or neglected to track this population. The book is Men Without Work. Nicholas Eberstadt is the author. He is updated. It has a new introduction. It also has comments by Jared Bernstein and Henry Olson. Nick, one of the things that I'm struck by right now, again and again, is these numbers are changing not only for men, but also for women. Do I read you correctly? That Absolutely. women without work is a rising category. Yes. Well, unfortunately, the men without work problem that I described uh, in the first edition is uh, worse now than it was then. You could almost draw a straight line from uh, 1965 to the first edition of the book to where we are now six years later. It's a kind of uncanny. But it looks as if other population groups may also be joining this flight from work, including people who are older Americans, 55 plus, 65 plus. And uh, now we're seeing some, I think, warning signs for prime age women. I don't want to say it's a red flashing light, but maybe a yellow flashing light. Is it a shock or is it a shift of the labor force? Nick asked that question. What is the China shock? How would that contribute to the to the unknowns? Well, the China, the first China shock was the China entering the uh, World Trade Organization, which uh, provided uh, an avenue for Chinese manufacturing and low cost goods into our economy, did a lot of things to lower inflation in the US, but it also uh, wreaked havoc on our manufacturing sector over the course of a few years and uh, changed uh, changed our manufacturing patterns, including work. I mean, we've had a China shock with, uh, you know, with, with COVID as well. And that uh, that brought us to the brink of a global uh, economic collapse with the shutdowns that you described. And we also have right now an introduction to, I think it's called Universal Base, Base Basic, Basic Income, Income. U, UBI, which yep. is a debate in our allies. You note that the supplementary checks that were uh, from the Trump administration and the Biden administration serve as that, but there was also the unemployment benefits mm -hmm. that were I think you report them, they were $600 a week, and then they were reduced to $300 a week. And can you see those in the statistics for not in the labor force? Um, you, can, uh, you can see that there has been a delayed return to work in the United States. Um, partly, I think these, um, everybody remembers the $600 and the $300 a week checks, which you could get even if you weren't unemployed, even if you had a fairly high level of income. Everybody remembers that. But there was even more, John. There was, uh, with the enormous government transfers that were sent out to avoid uh, a second Great Depression, and, you know, and may have helped us avoid a second Great Depression, um, government spent so much borrowed money on uh, supporting uh, families and businesses in the United States that the U.S. personal disposable, disposable income actually went up in 2020 and 2021 above trend. It's the only national economic crisis in history in which people's purchasing power went up. And because of this, uh, savings rates doubled. Uh, above trend savings amounted to over two and a half trillion dollars. Now that nest egg could be used either to supplement earnings or to substitute for them. And at the moment, we have about 3 million fewer people in the workforce than we would have expected on pre-pandemic trends. What is to be done? You point to J.D. Vance, who's now a prominent candidate for political office, but his book about his relatives or everyone his relatives know, gaming the system. What does that mean, Nick? A gaming the system means that you figure out how you can work the 
uh, the panoply of various uh, government benefits uh, to your advantage. And one of the things which uh, unfortunately is quite real about our archipelago of disjointed uh, disability programs is that it's sometimes possible to qualify for disability by claiming something that can't be falsified. The two most rapidly growing uh, areas of claims and disability are musculoskeletal and psychological. Now, if we go to the doctor, they'll show whether our leg is broken or not. But if I say my back's hurt, or if I say I've got sad feelings, that can't be disproved. The what is to be done also includes the questions of how can we make work more desirable or fit the supply side that doesn't eliminate the criminality problem that doesn't eliminate the drug addiction problem but it does speak to reducing the disincentives i'm quoting you here what would that look like nick well i think there are a couple of things that government can do there are some things that government cannot do government cannot fix our broken families government cannot uh, revitalize our national morale or our faith uh, but government can help to fill the gap in, let's say, vocational skills, which has been opened by the um, shockingly uneven performance in our school system. It can think about uh, turning around our disability and uh, social welfare programs to bring about, let's say, a work first principle. Uh, every every uh, intervention has an unintended consequence and there'd be an unintended consequence there too but i think it might be smaller than the ones we have and government can throw a spotlight on the you know, the one in seven uh adult men who has a felony conviction in his background we can't have evidence-based policies for how to help people re-enter the workforce or families or societies if we don't have the evidence and we're missing that right now we don't have statistics for criminality afterwards. We don't have statistics for who's part-time, not in the labor force, who is black market, not in the labor force. Mm -hmm. We're missing a great deal of information that would support or in some way enhance men without work. The post-pandemic edition, so far post-pandemic. Nicholas Eberstadt is the author. Nick is at the American Enterprise Institute. He's a political economist. He holds the Henry Wendt Chair at the Institute. This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Patchler.